Welcome everyone to the SPA webinar. The, uh, we are going to be discussing the new position statement regarding physical therapy disability documentation and disclosure. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items. We're really glad that everyone could come. Uh, we're going to start out with a uh, presentation uh, providing some information about the new disability documentation document. And then we are going to have a, a group of uh, very uh, knowledgeable and experienced panelists that will join. I'll introduce them later. And we'll have them uh, answer questions and we can have a moderated discussion on that. So to help uh, facilitate that, uh, as the presentation goes through, as you think of questions, please enter them into the GoToWebinar chat. So if you look, on the bottom area, you can enter questions in, and then I can uh, facilitate having the panelists speak to those um, after the presentation. So, but please enter them uh, during the course so that we have um, a nice, fruitful discussion after the session. All right, and if you're having any challenges with your audio, there is an audio area, and you can either choose mic and speakers to your computer, or if that's not working, you're welcome to call in via telephone. All right, so thank you so much for uh, coming to uh, discuss this today. This uh, was a long time in the making. There was a lot of people that uh, were very involved in, this, in the creation of this document. And we're getting some great feedback that it's going to provide a lot of value to physical therapists and SPA members. So thank you for taking the time to discuss it. So uh, I thought it'd be helpful to take a few minutes to talk about the background or where, where this began. Uh, so uh, we are very appreciative of our members and the feedback that we get uh, around challenges that, our, um, that members are experiencing. And SPA is uh, very dedicated to uh, supporting members and advocating and uh, uh, keeping their best interests in mind, as well as uh, working towards best practice for physical therapy. Uh, so the challenge that was initially experienced uh, were that um, it was brought to us by um, a board member and uh, that um, it was common for there to be challenges where third party payers or perhaps employers were requiring documentation around disability or ability and uh, sometimes these requests um, uh, were uh, presented and they could be having maybe too urgent, they had too short of a timeline, they had a deadline that wasn't reasonable, especially if there was functional testing required to properly complete the, uh, the forms and to fulfill our obligations as physical therapists. And then one of the primary challenges was that in many cases the funding was unclear, so uh, it was not stipulated whether the employer, uh, the third party payer or the patient or claimant was responsible for covering the costs associated with those, which then could create challenges in that uh, the physical therapist uh, or the clinic was under pressure to provide the turnaround on these without having that uh, clear indication of how they would be compensated for the time required to complete those. Um, and then, uh, so at that point, uh, SPA, created a task force and I want to acknowledge the work of the task force because they uh, put a lot of uh, input into this and helped to uh, begin uh, the investigation of this. So uh, Richard Barassa was very instrumental in starting the task force and uh, assisting with uh, the initial research of it. Uh, we also had Isabel Johnson was also very involved in the task force and the SPA leadership, our president and our executive director, um, they are very well connected and have the support of our uh, parent, the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. So they took uh, some of the challenges that we were having and the experiences and brought them to leadership meetings with CPA. And they were able to garner more expertise and uh, input from other jurisdictions in terms of how they were managing these challenges, as well as uh, solutions and, um, and other uh, sort of uncovered other potential issues that we should be considering in terms of best practice and, uh, and professional conduct. 
And so some of those other things that uh, came up were, were included the regulatory requirements uh, that we should be following uh, in association with these third party uh, requests, um, a, our uh, regulatory guidelines. Um, we did a, a fairly deep review in terms of uh, those guidelines and even uh, legislation around insurance uh, providers and what their obligations are uh, with respect to this. So um, the other issue looking at the patient's uh, scenario Scenario, or looking at the, parent, the patient's uh, considerations when there's been a third party request uh, for information. Uh, the patients may lack clarity and understanding how the information is going to be used or shared, uh, which can uh, then uh, create a negative uh, experience for the patient, but then it could even put the physical therapist um, uh, sort of at risk for um, uh, complaints and challenges with respect to that. And then also the third party payer may not be aware of the process and some of the uh, obligations of physical therapists, um, as well as their um, uh, the lit, um, regulatory guidelines, as well as the time required and that functional testing is needed in many cases and that it has to be compensated. So having um, an awareness level. And then as, as we went in, that sometimes also extends to other healthcare providers um, and they are sometimes sending these forms on to physical therapists and it's important that they understand uh, the process that needs to go through to properly and professionally uh, complete the tasks required. So on our journey, I'll just, yeah, I go through. So we had the task force. The task force created an initial draft and it was more focused on the payment piece. But then on this initial, uh, on the uh, further discussion with CPK leadership and, uh, and other jurisdictions, um, and we uh, had one individual in particular from Ontario that had extensive experience working with third party payers and insurance companies, uh, we were able to uh, expand um, our position statement to include some of those other areas, including consent and um, uh, purpose for disclosure, and I'll go into those in a little bit more detail after. Um, we then uh, I thought it was very helpful, and I'm glad we were able to have the opportunity to consult with SCPT, so they reviewed it, gave some feedback and edits to it. Um, we also had input from the SPA board, and uh, then we invested in some legal consultation. Uh, so we had um, a lawyer provide additional revisions. Uh, they added the um, uh, proxy piece um, uh, to allow uh, someone to sign on behalf of the patient um, in a power of attorney situation. Uh, and then we also more recently had our third party payers committee review and provide feedback, um, and then uh, distribution to the membership. And then uh, from here, we thought that it was helpful to uh, provide some education to the members, have a chance to discuss it. And um, in addition, the third party pairs committee and SPA will be looking at distributing this to um, maybe specific um, employers or, and or insurance companies uh, and healthcare providers that we feel that understanding this guideline and where our profession is coming from would be helpful. So, uh, so just to give a little bit of a clarification, um, it's intended for primary care physical therapy. It's not, uh, it doesn't expand to multidisciplinary models, independent examinations. Um, it is also more targeted towards uh, third party payers, but excluding SGI and WCD because they have other legislation that would, and. Um, uh, guidelines that are um, allow the process of information flow to help it happen for those organizations. So this is more targeted outside of those organizations. And it's intended to guide members to follow professional standards of care while respecting third party requests and set expectations related to adequate compensation for PTs who meet these requirements. So just keying in on a couple key or um, a few of the key points of the document. Uh, there is, um, uh, it's highly advisable the, that the consent be um, expressed, written, and informed. Uh, so while it could be verbal, um, um, the written is uh, having them sign um, and having it in, a, in an actual document is, uh, would be best practice. 
Um, it's important that the purpose for the uh, per, um, personal health information being disclosed is um, uh, being the purpose for it being requested is outlined uh, to the patient. And it's important that the consent um, includes key information that we'll go into and the patient must be informed prior to signing this. So a big piece and with this population in particular, the purpose of the third party request is really critical, um, especially um, if uh, there could be um, consequences to the employee's work status or their claim benefits, their claim, the claimant's benefits. And so it is the responsibility of the person, of the third party that's making the request for the PHI that, um, or their personal health information, that they explain uh, the purpose for requesting the information. And uh, as a physical therapist, it's important that if the patient doesn't understand why it's being uh, requested, um, to be best practice to loot them and refer them back to uh, to the employer insurer to make sure that that's uh, clearly understood. So um, as I mentioned, it's important that we're following the regulatory guidelines. So we are very fortunate to have some great guidance from SCPT. Now these uh, there's a couple of regulatory guidelines number 25. Um, informed consent um, and also a number eight release of information that are relevant to the scenario that we referenced in the position statement and but you'll learn um, just wanting to give everybody the heads up um, and we're fortunate to have Jody Rice the SCPT practice advisor on our panel later for our discussion and she's going to talk about some of the upcoming changes so these practice guidelines uh, will be um, evolving into and being combined with some other documents so we'll hear more about that later but for now, uh, the reference would be these practice guidelines. Uh, so just a key, a couple um, uh, things. So I just pulled out the relevant piece. So uh, we must uh, obtain the informed consent for sharing and release of information, explain the service options, risk, benefits, potential, and possible consequences. And again, that should be coming from the third party payer as well. And then for release of information, um, uh, there's a, in, there can be two scenarios. You can provide your own consent, and the position statement actually provides a template for that if you choose, um, or if that's the route that you go, or the third, or you could have your own version, and we uh, encourage that. Um, the other option is, or the other scenario would be that the third party payer may have um, facilitated that consent and have the patient um, sign it in advance. And if that's the situation, um, the uh, physical therapist would have to interpret the adequacy of the consent being provided and make sure that it meets the elements. And we'll go through those uh, shortly. And then uh, another key piece of the release of information is that a, um, a physical therapist should only disclose their own physical therapy treatment rec uh, records to the insurer. They shouldn't disclose the records of many of any other healthcare professionals. And and that comes. Um, it's uh, related to um, uh, third party payers are not trustees under HIPAA. And so with um, protecting the health information, um, it, it should only happen when there's consent and uh, the physical therapist should also verify the identity of the recipient to make sure that, um, uh, that it's appropriate. So uh, when designing your own consent or may, perhaps evaluating the consent that has been provided to you by a third party pair, uh, there's a few uh, things that be, should be considered. So the description of the ACT services assessments and reports being requested, the purpose we talked about, um, and as well as the potential impact. And, um, and, then, um, the, and then this looping back to our original goal um, <laughs> with this and advocating for physiotherapists, it's very important that physical therapists um, uh, are, uh, it's identified who will be responsible for payment. So in all fairness, there should be ideally an estimation of the cost associated to complete the acts and assessments uh, that would be needed to fulfill the request. Um, and having all of that organized so that um, the clinic or the physiotherapist isn't at risk for uh, not receiving compensation for their time. And then as well as acknowledging that the employee, employee or claimant voluntarily consents to the collection, use and disclosure of 
their personal health information. So, and then if, if it's a, a consent coming to you that you're reviewing, you wanna make sure it meets all those requirements, but then also maybe zero in, does it authorize the full spectrum of act services and assessments needed to prepare the reports? Um, so if there, and clearly if there is a need for functional testing, making sure that it um, uh, allows for that. And then identifying the party that'll be responsible for the payment that we discussed. And then if there's any um, uh, concern around the validity of the request, um, obviously it should be uh, verified prior to uh, providing that to information. So just a key piece, and this was a big discussion area of the task force is, uh, that PTs need to have adequate funding in order to do the functional testing that uh, is potentially needed to meet the demands of the test of the form or the documentation. And so in many cases, um, uh, physical therapists will have to do specific testing to be able to quantify uh, lifting, for example, tolerance, walking tolerance, uh, sitting tolerance, etc. cetera. Um, there might be some measurements that would be available in the chart, but others may not. And um, the objective testing to provide those specific uh, measurements may be required down the road in order to defend how the data or the reported results were achieved. And then thinking about it from the patient's standpoint, it would protect the rights of the patient to an objective, to having that objective information, especially if they were in a situation where they were um, uh, in pursuit of a fairs, fair claims adjudication. So, uh, and then uh, just a key, um, some key things, and this was included in the position statement, um, knowing that it might be used by different parties. So the responsibilities of the compensate, um, responsibility for compensating the health provider. Uh, so uh, it's definitely the SPA's position that uh, third party requests should not proceed without clear identification of the party responsible for the associated cost, ideally in writing. And, um, and our intent was to provide this, this document could be provided to help to facilitate that communication. Um, if, and there's a few uh, guidelines here uh, when communicating about payments. So if the employee or the claimant is expected to pay, um, the employer sure must communicate this expectation to the employer or claimant prior to submitting the request. If the insurer is paying the cost, uh, that should be stated in the request, and if it's un um, or or the employer who um, if either of those, it should be clearly stated. And if it's unclear, the PT should refer the employer claimant um, to the third party to have that piece clarified prior to uh, proceeding with the request. Uh, so to help uh, to the other area that in, in our investigation is that, um, and again, this comes to sometimes third party pairs or employees don't realize that functional testing is required and the time uh, that can be associated with that. And so uh, we did uh, re put some uh, references around um, uh, market rates. So the, uh, the uh, wor workers' compensation board rates are negotiated um, uh, by SPA and WCD. And then we do look at comparables. So it would be um, a potential reference to you. So we've used that in the document. Um, uh, to provide a reasonable rate, uh, and um, we've included the um, the current WCB rates in the document. It'll be updated over time um, as those change, um, and we uh, reference the functional ability evaluation uh, rate for twenty minute for every twenty minutes, as well as um, what a, a typical two page assessment report would be um, uh, compensated at. Now, I just wanna um, also mention on that, this is for every clinic to determine uh, the fees that you will charge. Uh, definitely SPA would not mandate uh, that a specific fee should be charged. It is definitely up to uh, the clinic and there'd be many, many factors that would go into that decision. Uh, on a timeline uh, perspective, um, it's important that the, um, that the physical therapist has adequate time to do the testing that's required. And so the guideline does uh, provide a recommendation of um, recommending a minimum of 10 business days, 
uh, for forms or functional reports. And if there's complex te testing required, that could extend to 20 business days to allow time to adequately schedule them into the um, uh, to for the appointments as well as to complete the documentation. Uh, so to summarize, um, uh, this chart is provided in the document. Uh, so uh, what, what it is triggered by the request, obviously, from the third party. Uh, so it should describe the ACT services reports being requested. Uh, then there would be, um, uh, it's critical that, and it is the third party's responsibility to explain the purpose of collecting the information to the employee or claimant. Um, and then uh, there should be a cost estimate of uh, what um, uh, services, what testing would be required and uh, the costs associated with those. And then it should be designated the uh, party responsible for payment and then uh, supply the informed uh, consent, which is then uh, signed um, uh, by the patient or claimant. So, um, and we have um, just to share, so this information is all provided in detail with the references um, in the document and it's available on the SPA website. Um, and we will also uh, indicate at the end of it, it has a template uh, that um, if you're wanting to incorporate this into your practice or um, have a template that would cover all of the elements, this is uh, something you, you're welcome to use. Um, if, um, I recommend that you also get legal consultation um, uh, if you're uh, significantly modifying it or if you want to use it in your scenario as well. All right. And then lastly, uh, we have now uh, come to the to the fun part, the, uh, the panel discussion. So I am very excited to introduce uh, our panelists this evening to be able to speak to their experiences in the in different areas. So we're really excited to um, uh, have a number of panelists join. So we have Jody Rice. Uh, who is the practice advisor with SCPT. So you're welcome to turn your webcams on. Uh, uh, great, so there we have Jody. So thank you for joining us, Jody. Um, and uh, we also have Tanner Treen. He's a physical therapist uh, with LifeMark. And we have Jason Vogelsang, the executive director of the SCPT. Uh, so we're very excited to have them uh, join in and uh, we can uh, begin our, our discussion. So please feel free to uh, enter questions uh, into the uh, discussion area and we'd be happy to discuss them. Uh, so, but I'm gonna start out with, as I alluded to earlier, Jody, there's some changes to the practice guidelines and SCBT is always doing updates and. Uh, advancing and improving. So can you share with us some of the changes that we can uh, anticipate seeing in the near future? Well, some of the changes definitely relate to the document that you produced. And again, thank you to SPA for taking the time to respond to the members' needs. And we're certainly happy to be here as well, Jason and I, to bring a, a regulatory perspective. Changes to the website are probably going to be ongoing over the next little while and changes to how documents are presented will also change. And the reason for that is that we really find that we need to be more clear and concise with the regulatory language. So one of the main changes will be that the practice guidelines and including the practice guidelines that you've referenced in this document will be leaving uh, the website and those guidelines and all the information on them will either be included in the standards of practice or if it's a major issue such as something around consent and um, other regulatory issues that are more significant like advertising consent some of those things the plan is to actually develop a practice um, resource that will kind of have more more information it'll be more comprehensive and i think it'll be more readable and more accessible to the public and to the members so we're pretty excited about trying to provide better information more easily accessible so i think that's kind of the main the main change so you'll look for a change in in the standards the core standards will be the same there may be some information added to them the practice guidelines will be removed, but in place of them, you'll have more and probably more easily accessible information in practice resources. So that's 
the main change that's going to happen. So we'll certainly keep SPA aware and members aware of those changes. We're going to be having information sessions on the new standards and certainly on any practice resources that, that will be developed. And we'll certainly keep SPA aware of that so that you can modify your document or provide other resources and links as needed for, for the members. Right. Uh, well, thank you, Jody, and we we look forward to seeing those and um, and learning more about the work that uh, that the SCBT and your committees have done. So, thank you for sharing that information. Uh, all right, I just discovered we had a couple of our panelists were uh, attendees, so I've now elevated you to uh, panelists. So you're welcome to turn your webcams on, uh, uh, Russ and Doria, um, uh, if you're able to join us. So. Um, Oh, there we go. Welcome. So we have um, we have Russ Dawson. Uh, he's a regional director with LifeMark, and he's also a member of the third party payer committee with SPA. And Doria McCallishan, thank you for joining us as a panelist. Uh, uh, Dory is a physical therapist with SHA, and she's also an SPA board member and uh, a member of the third party payers committee, uh, uh, chair of the th third party payers committee with SPA. Uh, great, so uh, thanks so much for joining us. All right, and uh, next question here, uh, and this one is for Tanner. So Tanner, as a physical therapist, um, uh, regularly receiving third-party uh, payer requests uh, for disability documentation, uh, there can be challenges. So can you share with us, what is the biggest uh, challenge that you experience uh, with third-party payer requests? Uh, for information, and and do you have any tips for uh, for the viewers today in terms of uh, managing those? Yeah, thanks. I think I think probably the biggest challenge that uh, that we run into is uh, highlighted in in the presentation in the document is kind of people or clients patients understanding um, the reason for why the testing is being requested, and a lot of the times if it's not adequately explained by the funder it can turn into or feel like it turns into a bit of situation where the patient starts to assume that the physiotherapist or the, the practitioner in this instance is now, you know, um, advocating for the funder more so for the than, than for the patient. Um, so a lot of the times we were, at least for myself, I try to make sure that, um, you know, the, the information sent from the funder clearly communicates that it is their request and, and, uh, and if there is a uncertainty on the behalf of the patient, or I'm starting to get the sense that there's a little bit of concern on their part that um, the therapeutic alliance between myself and the patient is being affected, um, I'll, I'll, in general, um, defer the testing if possible, or at least try to refer to the consent form that was submitted and, um, and kind of ensure that they do have a, a, a fully informed understanding of the document, um, even if it means that the, um, the testing itself has to be delayed or rescheduled, um, I think that to the point of the um, all the work that was done to investigate um, you know, the best practices in this situation, we definitely need to put informed consent at the, the top of our priority and, and making sure that the clients are really aware um, that we are in a way representing their best interests by communicating you know information that is relevant to their their function and their their rehabilitation and their care um, but also making sure that the funder is not um, putting the responsibility for explaining why the testing needs to be done onto the therapist um, that's something that I, again I've, I've experienced in the past and uh, and over time have become more and more comfortable basically putting that responsibility back onto the funder and saying that if you're going to request this information you you can't jeopardize the therapeutic alliance by um, trying to turn the, the therapist into an advocate for rationalizing the need for testing. That, that's the, the funder's responsibility. And so I, I, I'm fairly um, comfortable with um, strongly um, interacting with the funders in that regard if we get pushback um, where they're, they're trying to, like I said, um, put the responsibility onto us. Um, but I would say the therapeutic alliance in these situations is one of the big uh, barriers that can sometimes come up. And, and in many cases, like I said, if it starts to appear that the client is 
is losing um, trust or comfort in the situation or in that particular session, then in general, I'll try to defer and say, okay, no, we're, we, this is not appropriate to do today. Um, we'll need to reschedule once you've had a chance to follow up with the funder or, or the third party and to actually really understand the rationale and potential consequences for, for this kind of testing. So um, I say that is, that is rare, um, but it does come up. And I think that having a plan in place for those uh, potentially mitigating the difficult conversations or jeopardizing therapeutic alliance is uh, is quite important. Um, so that that in terms of management would be my my number one thing from having done uh, a variety of different functional testing and reporting. Um, I think a lot of the other points that you raised in terms of advocating um, for adequate compensation are, are well founded. Um, I did make a point to uh, to Russ when we were chatting about it that the WCB rates, in, in my opinion, are kind of um, based on uh, volume partially as well. So it's worth people considering the fact that when interacting with individual funders, um, those rates might be a little bit on the, the low end of what um, another funder might request. So taking that into consideration, I think is valuable for practitioners and clinics, um, just to continue to advocate for the quality of information that's being provided, um, particularly for insurance providers that are, uh, um, or, or funders that are used to sending fairly large, dense documents without a second thought and then establishing kind of their own internal, yeah, they will pay you $50 for this. It's, uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's not necessarily a two-way conversation, which, uh, which I think a lot of times for myself, we, we've gotten into the habit as a profession of accepting what we can get as opposed to really advocating for the value of our time and our expertise because uh, we are the in my opinion, the ones that are most suited to provide this information. Um, and so if we uh, we should treat ourselves as, as specialists in the field when it comes to providing that data to the funder, but also that opinion to um, to ensure that the client is getting the best possible care and outcome um, when it comes to this kind of testing. So um, the only other thing I would say is thoroughly explaining the, the privacy regulations to the client um, and explaining that this is information that has been requested and, and kind of ensuring that as noted in the presentation of the document, we're not gonna disclose um, information that isn't relevant to the care that we've provided, the assessment that we've completed. Um, some people have concerns about, in particular, I've found whether or not things related to chronic conditions or mental health conditions will be disclosed. And so ensuring that, um, those conversations have been had between the funder and the patient, and then also ensuring that the you know the the notes that we've completed um, aren't referencing things that are outside of our scope of practice um, or putting patients in a situation where they feel that they are um, you know being disadvantaged or that the outcome will be negative because of uh, you know us overstepping potentially professional um, guidelines or boundaries. Um, I think that's another thing that I'm definitely. Uh, have learned over time to be very aware of is explaining that to the patient definitely does seem to ease some of that tension or or if there is concern on the part of the patient about what's being communicated, um, just thoroughly explaining what what information we're entitled to provide and what the what from our perspective we can do to fulfill the request of the funder. Thanks, Tanner. Um, uh, very, very great advice and uh, excellent from a, a practical standpoint. So thanks for sharing. So Doria, you have uh, experience in private practice, but also uh, recently extensive experience in the public practice uh, where this can also come up. Can you share uh, from a public practice where um, uh, any challenges or uh, advice in terms of managing third party uh, requests? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, from my end, I'm working in the neurological outpatient area. And some of the challenge that, that we're seeing uh, with third party payers is, again, they want an extensive uh, functional testing done. And our particular department does not have what a private practice necessarily would have for those particular things. So we're seeing a lot of younger people coming through with neurological conditions um, and they are still in the workforce. So um, what has come up uh, and we've discussed it as a team is that we make the re we do what we report on what we can what we can test and then we often make recommendations for those um, clients or patients to go into sort of the orthopedic world of private practice to have more of that functional testing done. Um, 
And uh, the other thing that comes up is, and I think Tanner mentioned that, is when the third party insurer just says we're going to pay this much amount, that's always in a challenge. And so um, I recommend to the team that I work with is that uh, you report on on what you can report and you just give what the, the, the bare minimum if it's going to be taking an excessive amount of time. And I agree with Tanner in, in that we we need to be compensated for the time that we, we take for this and the specialty specialties that we work in. Um, the other challenge I think, and I've seen this more when I worked in private practice, is that what happens when you have the uh, return to work form requested and then they put the, um, the onus on the patient to pay for it. So those, those I think I've seen those, th those tend to be a little bit more simpler reports they want sometimes, but it's like here you have a patient who is injured, they have financial issues to begin with, and then the therapist has this moral dilemma of how much do I charge this person who doesn't have a lot of finances going on um, and, and, the, and the employer is not paying for it. I don't, I don't know if we're seeing that as much now as we did in the past, but that certainly was one of the challenges uh, that I have seen uh, working in the past in private practice from some of the other third party payers, the, you know, the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. I, I would say yeah that's that's pretty consistent with what I've experienced as well is that there is often an onus placed on the patient one of the ways we have partially worked around that is that if the insurance provider is putting the onus on the patient to pay for a report then sometimes what we'll do and, and this is not the best uh, workaround but we'll basically discuss with the patient and say okay this session is going to be the testing and the completion of your report that way it still fits under a physiotherapy session that could be billed to the insurer um, but, uh, but like you said we're we're trying to offset the cost onus onto the client particularly in situations situations like Joria mentioned where, where finances are a barrier to care. Um, again, it, it does limit their, you know, the treatment they're getting in session, but overall, I think for most people, it, it does help to alleviate some of the stress or concern about meeting the financial obligation or at least getting communication. Because oftentimes there's quite a lot of pressure from the funder um, on the patient to, you know, get the information um, uh, yeah. you know, as soon as possible. So I would agree with Doria there. Yeah. yeah. And then just, just back to the, the whole neurological, um, uh, clients it's maybe that's something we need to advocate for as well like that is such a different world of, of rehabilitation and return to works and you know the the, the functional um, you know the problems with spasticity ongoing spasticity in an arm with someone who is like a mechanic you know how do we deal with those long term those long term ones those are those are chronic neuro those are, can be debilitating chronic neurological problems or you know the the, the length of recovery is is longer because of it. So that's kind of that. And that's been interesting for me because I did spend a lot of years in private practice doing MSK and orthopedics and now moving into the neurological world, it's, it's going to become ongoingly more, it's going to become more prevalent because I, again, there are more and more younger people who are still in the workforce that are having neurological events. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so here's one uh, for Jason and Jody. Uh, so, um, and well, any of the panelists, you feel free to jump into this. Um, so, uh, the question is: Our legal advice is more often than not that the whole file contents are to be released with the patient consent and understanding. The patient may be disadvantaged if all information is not shared. Negatively adjudication, negatively adjudicate may be possible. Negative adjudication is the largest percentage of regulatory complaints. It is the suggestion that the SCPT regulations prohibit release of the complete file. Um, I don't know that they prohibit release of the complete file. I think there has to be the informed consent and the understanding of the patient as to what they're consenting to and what, what is being released. Um, typically, we would release what the third party payer was specifically requesting. So I'm maybe not understanding the question 100%, but typically my understanding is, and Tanner and Doria probably have more information about this, but typically my understanding is that they request specific information related to the specific condition that's being addressed. So I would think it would be 
not typical for them to request the entire chart? That's usually, I, I mean, we get those requests. They're usually not the same as something that's specifically related to function. Um, I think that the, the document that we're referencing here from my reading of it is more specific to um, some form of comment or evaluation of current functional capacity for non WCB, non SGI, non um, kind of contracted third party funders and just having, like I said, a, a, a template for suggestion for how to best manage those cases. But for something like a chart review that's more comprehensive, I mean, those, uh, those like you said, would include everything and it would just be based on the funder's request. Right. I, I think, I, I mean, as a practitioner, I'm always a little bit nervous when they want the entire file. Um, again, like Tanner referred to, maybe there's something within there that you've documented about the patient's mental health that they don't want to share. Uh, and, and usually when they're requesting the whole file, I would think it, there's usually, they're having hopefully medical people reviewing that. I would see that more in the, you know, maybe secondary, tertiary level, higher level or it doesn't happen very often. I mean, I know in the hospital situation, we're not getting a request for the entire file, or if we are, it's going to medical records, and they're requesting it from our medical records, and then they have their rules re releasing it from there. Um, but I, I guess I would question why they need the entire file when we're providing specific information uh, regarding the patient on, you know, return to work. Mm -hmm. It's just been my comment. Yeah, so it sounds like there's, um, yeah, different ex or different people have experienced different situations. Uh, some, uh, some of the therapists, some of the attendees have indicated that that does seem to be a frequent request for the um, entire chart. Um, and a comment, in many cases, there is a threat of timelines. For example, placing the responsibility of obtaining and funding the report or testing by a set date or loss of benefits. This raises the risk of loss of benefits for lack of completion of adjudication information required. This raises a risk of complaint if not completed by the timeline. Jason, Jody, make sure the audience understands how the complaint process works. Um, so do you have any um, uh, comments uh, with respect to um, uh, being in this situation or maybe share some experiences where um, uh, there there is an urgency so and with um, with uh, the demand on the physical therapist to complete the testing within a specific timeline and then that risk of loss of benefits and um, and sort of some of the risk associated with that. I think I might have to defer this to Jason just because it involves the complaint process. I think that was part of the question and that's kind of not something that I as the practice advisor am directly involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jason, do you want to comment on the complaint process? Can you repeat the, the, the question? I didn't pick up exactly um, the, the relation to the complaint process. Uh, so, um, the timeline, the tight timeline um, for the completion of uh, the adjudication information required, um, it could raise the risk of complaint if it's not completed within the required timeline. So just understanding um, if there's a, a volume of testing or reporting required and a tight timeline that's not completed in the timeline, uh, could that relate to a complaint? Um, Yes and no, in, in terms of um, we have zero control as to who submits a complaint and when they submit a complaint and why they submit a complaint. Um, so if, if it's the, the client submitting it because they didn't meet guidelines that were, or timelines rather, that was uh, expressed by the third party, we have no control over that um, as we, we receive them. Uh, and I don't, in, in my limited time, I didn't, I haven't seen a complaint by a third party saying that the, the practitioner was unreasonable in their timelines. Um, I'm not uh, privy to the, the, the deliberations of the Professional Conduct Committee in reviewing those complaints and investigating those complaints, but what I can reassure the, the group is that committee is your peers uh, and they understand um, the, the, the 
challenges and the pressures uh, of, of the practitioners. Uh, and uh, I certainly know from my previous experience um, with uh, the teachers, uh, the PCC was very cognizant of those pressures in, in the field. Um, th and, and they understood the, the, some of the motivation behind um, the, the complaint. Uh, and they quickly be, were able to read between the lines uh, of, of the complaint, if it, what was the root cause. If it was a timeline, then you know we can address that. Uh, but that's not as necessarily as serious as you know a, a safety concern and things like that. So um, that's probably the best I can provide tonight in terms of that relation uh, is that reassurance that um, the, the members of the professional conduct committee are your peers and they understand, um, like I said, the, the the pressures and the challenges and and the the, the bottlenecks uh, of, of practice. And so, um, sort of expansion of the scenario. So, if a patient loses their benefits um, uh, because of the report completion um, not falling within the required timeline, and then uh, it would be the patient making the complaint against the physical therapist um, due to the timeline challenge. So, I can make uh, a comment on that. Just in practice, um, the recommendation I've been I've given to my teams is kind of going back to the beginning on the consent portion of just having clear communication both with the client and the third party payer of here's what you're requesting here's what we can do as a timeline turnaround so that they're that you know to try to get yourselves all on the same page because sometimes those timelines where that emergency request is coming from it's sometimes difficult to determine if it's the client thinking that it's it, it is that urgent or the employer um, so just having that communication up front, both about what are you requesting, here's, here's the cost, here's some reasonable timelines, are you in agreement on that? Um, Thanks, it, Russ. And that might be a situation where the, the uh, disability disclosure documentation guidelines um, where the position statement by, might be very helpful because it does give recommended timelines of the 10 business days or 20 for complex yeah. testing. Uh, so hopefully that can add some uh, reasonable expectations. Yeah, I, um, I wouldn't recommend this method, but I did see this and talk to this at a doctor's office and the doctor's office manager because they'd have people coming in, I need this return to work filled in by like by today. And they had a sign, if you need a form that's due today, your lack of planning is not our emergency. <laughs> Good one. So uh, I, I'm not saying to put that up, but uh, I have seen that up in two doctor's offices. So. And, yeah, and my experience with third party payers and that kind of request is usually, uh, again, the, the client or the patient is bringing in this form and saying, I'd need this in a couple days. And usually we've we've contacted the 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 employer or the insurance company and said I've just gotten it now. There's no way I it's that it's a, that's the communication piece that you're speaking to Russ again. If it's if it's not a, a practical and then you have to you have to make the decision to contact them and say I'm sorry we can't do this in this timeline. Yeah, yeah. yeah I I've, mean, I've had sorry go ahead. Okay. I, there's this the, the employers put a lot on the clients like the employers sometimes just dump on the clients and they're like I don't know I got to fill out this form I mean that and, and if I don't it if I don't fill it out by such and such a day they're going to cut me off you know and it's that understanding on their part you know I, I was just going to say that similar to Doria's point earlier about you know the complexity of some of the clientele that we're seeing like on my clientele I see a fair amount of people who have uh, concussion, post-concussion, vestibular, neurological dysfunction, like those kind of people with cognition or memory concerns are going to get a form from their employer and then or from their insurer and it potentially isn't going to make their way to the practitioner for weeks or months. And so to have an honest conversation with the insurance provider about what's reasonable to expect the client given their injury or their condition to be able to um, to do within a specific time frame, I think all the points made about giving the practitioners more tools to advocate for more time based on their scheduling demands is, is well made but um, particularly recently I would say we're seeing lots of people who fall into you know both in and out of WCB and SGI systems um, who are getting pinned to 
physical recovery or soft tissue expectations when they have very complex injuries involving cognition, neurological dysfunction. And so um, the, the, the associated barriers that come with those, I think, need to be communicated to the funders and advocated for in terms of increasing timelines and, and just giving clients and practitioners the appropriate amount of time and awareness to complete any relevant testing or information gathering. And relating it back to to the complaint process, all of those points are, are very good and very valid. Um, but uh, the advice would then be to you know ensure you've had that communication uh, with the third party, with the client, uh, and to uh, robustly and appropriately document all of that. That would make any complaint that we do receive that investigation by the PCC would be that much quicker and smoother um, if you're able to document and provide that documentation to to the committee to say, look. Yeah, I received it on day one, uh, and they wanted it on day two. That just was not feasible. I had these conversations with with the appropriate people and things like that. So, as long as you can document and uh, indicate that you've done your due diligence and and followed all the the procedures that that we have forward in in terms of consent and um, care and and things like that, uh, you should be fine um, throughout that process. Um, but yes, the, the, the process itself can be stressful to, to a practitioner. Thanks, Jason. All right, uh, so next question. Uh, if the form has functional questions and both the patient or the insurer do not plan to pay for further testing, how do you go about completing this portion of the form? Do you complete subjectively and indicate or avoid completion of this portion of the form? Uh, Russ, do you want to tackle that one? Um, it well, it comes down to I, I would say getting that consent at the beginning. What is the what is your question? Because if they're you know wanting specifically a couple functional tests, that's what we'll focus on. If they want a fulsome objective measures, all that information, we'll give them a full report. But if it's is the question relating that they're only going to give you a certain amount of time, a certain amount of money, so you're only going to pick and choose. Um, so if there's no, if they have no, there's some subjective questions um, and then some that would require further testing, objective testing, but they're not planning to pay. Neither the patient or the insurer will pay for the testing. Um, do you just complete the subjective portion and give it back? Or do you, um, uh, or yeah, how do you suggest uh, proceeding? Uh, as a practitioner in the past, doing that, that's what I would do. I wouldn't give objective measures. I wouldn't give objective measures if I didn't test them. And also I wouldn't do objective measures like outside of, uh, of the appointment time, schedule time, you know, within reason. Um, and just address what the question that they have is like subjectively. And, and basically, and then coming back again on the communication, if you're needing this information, this is what it involves. It involves a test of 30 minutes, 45 minutes. This is gonna take an hour to get this information, um, just so that they're aware, because I think sometimes they don't think it's that big of a deal. Like they're just like, just fill out the form. But that does then, you know, if we're giving objective testing, that puts us at risk, but also too, then they're not getting a good actual report because now, now we're just guessing. Um, so. Just, just outlining what the expectation is and what the true nature of the question is. Sometimes they just need to have, you know, they'll have a long report, but really based on that person's job, like they're questioning a couple of the functional tests. Like, oh, is that what you want us to focus on? We can, we can kind of tweak the form down to um, what's most relevant. And that, that's, uh, Tanner, how would you expand on that? On, on yeah, so for me, for me, I would say this is where, like, having done FCE training, I kind of rely on a lot of that education that we got through that process, which is, I mean, you, you always start for a biomechanical exam for that reason. So if a form is asking you to comment on a client's function, you're not having time to get paid to do that, but you've checked range of motion, you've checked strength, and the question, you know, say in a shoulder case, if they have 50% range of motion and deflection, and it's asking what's this client's capacity for waist to shoulder and overhead lifting, you can pretty safely comment knowing that they are 
biomechanically limited without having to do functional testing. Like you, it, it doesn't always have to be specific to the task, I would say, if you have relevant data that would exclude the client from being appropriate for that kind of testing anyway. So though that might be an example of how you could provide some form of objective data just based on exclusion from your biomechanical exam and kind of the, the, the typical practice um, or assessment that we would do. Um, but if it does, to Russ's point, come down to they need very specific measurement or, or kind of information in terms of waist to shoulder, push pull, or things, you know, functional capacities that aren't as, as regional or, or specific to, um, you know, where you've done the majority of your assessment and treatment and evaluation. And I would say, yeah, it comes down to communicating that that information is not, uh, not readily available outside of appropriate testing and documentation and evaluation. Thanks. Okay, uh, next question. Um, can a physical therapist refuse to fill out a form if there is no payment or arrangements for payment? I think what what happens in public practice is that we tend to fill them out because, because we, work, we work in the public world. So in the private world, maybe you would look at that more as not filling it out, but in the in the public world, um, we we try and accommodate um, patients in, in in that way, but um, we would only fill the form out that we were able to test. Yeah, I would I would say even in the private world historically we've kind of eaten the cost, and I think part of the reason why documents like this and conversations like this are so valuable is because it does allow us to establish a bit more of a of a comprehensive um, recommendation in terms of as I said earlier advocating for the value of the information we're providing and then kind of the the time and uh, and expertise that it takes to generate that so. Um, yeah, we definitely leaned away from that. And I think to Russ's point as well, a lot of clinics in, in uh, physicians' offices will post signage explicitly stating form costs and things of this nature. Um, like I said, yeah, there, there's usually some flexibility around if it's a client, the onus is on the client and there's financial obligations that they're struggling to meet already. But um, yeah, I would say it, it, a big part of it comes down to collectively trying to advocate for, um, for appropriate compensation. And that's you were kind of talking before about the if they have a extended health care across Sun Life, whoever, whatever it is, and we're direct billing that insurance and someone gives us a form, um, that's and the person's like, well, I'm not going to pay for it. Nobody's going to pay for it. That's that's when we'd have the discussion. Well, leave us the form so the therapist can review it. And the next session you come in that we'll put on your extended health care, this is what we're going to go through. This is going to be your next session. We're going to be doing objective testing, which would still fall under um, physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thanks Russ for that recommendation. Uh, now, Doria, uh, there was a question uh, and Doria provided some uh, suggestion, but just looking if there's other recommendations, what would you suggest PTs uh, who work in facilities that don't have equipment to do functional testing for their client? That's a really can, good question. I can give one suggestion um, from WCB Alberta during COVID, um, and I can share the link with Garnett if it helps to distribute, but they actually came up with um, a list of household, household items of like weights and things like that so that people could do functional testing. Um, they actually approved functional testing virtually in, in Alberta. So using a clothing basket with these items in it equals this amount of weight. And, and so that was used as a research project with WCB Alberta. Um, so basically what I mean by that is you could use that, I'm not saying to do virtual testing. What I'm saying is to do, use that kind of guideline of here's a bunch of household items that have weights and then you could make, um, potentially make uh, some functional testing because often it's just some some lifting um, to to certain heights. And then what I would also say say is like certain things that you if you can't record, like force gauges are expensive if you don't have those. Uh, certain testing, you know, uh, things that you need that unable to test. And if they if the funder still really needs that information, okay, well, um, do they need to refer them to a different location to get? that specific functional information, if you can't provide it with your 
um, whatever capacity that you have there because you can get you know just a lifting box and certain weights to do some portions of the task but maybe not the full some one that the, the funder needs mm -hmm. great suggestion and yes if you could share that resource uh, we can set it sure. up in our follow-up email with the link to the recording and um and yeah additional resources thanks for us all right, so we are uh, nearing the end of our time. I want to be respectful of everybody's evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, special thanks to all the panelists, uh, Jason, Jody, Tanner, Russ, and Doria. You guys were uh, great. Thank you for sharing your practical experience, your um, uh, experience with regulation, and uh, overall uh, experience as, um, for our physiotherapy profession. So we really appreciate your time in supporting uh, this webinar. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I just wanted to just give a quick uh, save the date. Um, we have, oops, here we go, um, our uh, SPA is hosting a 2022 virtual AGM uh, on Saturday, April 30th, and we will be having a post-AGM member engagement event where we'll be talking about the practice-based assessment and we'll uh, again have uh, some information presented. Um, we'll be hosting Jason as well as a number of other panelists. Um, and we will uh, have a, a nice, wholesome discussion uh, after that event as well. And then we'll also have a virtual networking event uh, following uh, the, um, the panel discussion. So we would love to have everyone join us. So save the date. That'll be Saturday morning on April 30th. Uh, and more information will be emailed out by SPA and it'll be on our uh, website soon as the AGM notice goes out. All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a wonderful evening. And again, special thanks to the panelists. Bye.